one more time. This time with feeling. Looks like we're recording this time. <laughs> Chris Courtney here, New Pragmatic. Welcome to the feedback loop. Um, it is a pleasure to do this once again, even if we have to do it twice, because sometimes I forget to hit record. Um, today, we're going to have a little truncated feedback loop because, um, well, well, frankly, I've been through most of this at least once this morning. But we're doing a second recording for the good folks who are riding along. You know, one of the things about doing Feedback Loop is that if you're a member of the program and you want to sit in and ask questions during Feedback Loop, you can obviously do that. But if you are not able to do that, if you're not able to actually join in the recording of Feedback Loop, you can always watch the recording later, which is really helpful because let's face it, we've all got like busy lives and we can't always carve out 9 a.m. Central, Monday through Friday to attend. And that's one of the real benefits of um, having video recordings of these sessions is that um, designers who are part of the program can just follow along. They submit work anytime, anytime, Monday through Friday, and we do the, we, we do the feedback loop in the mornings. So with that, I wanted to, uh, let's, let's take a look at a couple things that are going on because um, it's, it's time to really begin looking at what people are doing throughout the program. And one of the things, one of the places I want to start is Luigi. Luigi really crushed it um, on his observational research. In case you're, in case you're wondering what, what we could possibly be talking about, uh, observational research is uh, one of the first chapters in the UX program. Um, I'm never going to ask you to do something that I wouldn't do myself. Here's actually a photo of where I was doing some observational research at a restaurant here um, uh, locally, uh, while I was while I was basically writing through the um, writing through the the curriculum for this, and um, one of the challenges here for this uh, for this for the UX course is you're trying to absorb you're trying to observe how people actually act and are there any commonalities in their shopping patterns. Um, when you're trying to determine, you know, product market fit, spending some time observing people and how they actually, how they actually go about their day is really important. So Luigi, you know, one of the things I think is important is doing this multiple times. So you can go to one store or one, one, uh, grocery, grocery outlet, um, and you can do it once. But you're never quite sure if is that an accurate depiction of of what the shopping experience is like, or should I do it again? And when you do it twice, you have a compare. You have uh, you have two sample sets to compare against one another. What I think is great is Luigi yesterday uh, spent some time in Brooklyn and in Chelsea. So uh, you know he um, the first place he went to was in the morning. The second place he went to was in the afternoon. And in the first place he went to, he had a total of 29 customers come through and he was observing all sorts of things like, you know, what were they buying? Were they distracted? Like, did they have their headphones in or did they have a phone? Um, what, you, what you'll what you see, uh, he also was denoting like, were they in a hurry? Did they like rush out? And this is quite common because it's like morning time. It's like time to go to work. And this is this is helpful to understand because it tells you of whether whether or not these people could really afford the time to, to be here. Um, there were a couple of people that like just literally sat down and I'm, I'm going to hang out. But there were a lot more people that like just rushed out immediately. The observation two set that he did, he had 180 customers in roughly the same amount of time. So in the, in the morning, it was like relatively slow. In the afternoon, like frantic. And the uh, Ouija was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I wasn't able to get the data on everybody. Uh, oddly enough, he got the data on 171 people. Cut yourself some slack, Luigi. So all in all, Luigi, over the course of one hour, uh, spread across two locations, did uh, hit two locations, observing, observing shopper patterns, and researched uh, and, and did research 
involving 200 participants. This is how you do it. This is how you do observational research. You sit down, you do it twice. You don't try to get it all in at once. You change locations and you observe and you take notes and you denote like, you know, a data connection, temperature, time, where it was, volume. Like these things are all really important because frankly, um, you know, what would what would the, this be like if it was rainy or snowy outside? What sort of things would be different about this? That and that's really the the other side of this. Like, I would love to go back and do this again, like when it's snowing, like in a couple of months. Like, I want to know I want to know what a shopper experience is like then versus now. Now you've got two basic weather weather incidents. Is it a higher volume? Is it a lower volume? Are people carrying more, carrying less? What are they doing with their umbrellas? Is it, like there's there's all sorts of observational information that we can glean out of this. Uh, but I, I think you did a great job. And in so many ways, this project, this observational research project, it builds into the next chapter. And um, it's, it's going to help you come up with great questions to ask when you get into your stakeholder interview. So great job, Luigi. Um, wanted to share that with everybody. Another thing that people are, are coming up uh, against, and if you've if you've been through the program, like Luigi's working through the UX um, through the UX course, um, Rebecca here is working through the Intro to Product Design course, and in the Intro to Product Design course, there is a there's a there's a chapter on actually finding work, and I was talking with Jeremy Jeremy and Rebecca are both um, are both actually on the job hunt, and one of the things that you have to do when you're when you're determining where you're going to apply and, and and what jobs you're interested in is you have to do research on those jobs and you have to do a self-evaluation of yourself of your skill set where you're at right now to determine uh, like what skills do i have and what skills do i not have based on this posting um you know obviously i want i want you to to know why you're interested in the position that typically comes down to do you have a connection with the company? Do you have a connection with their purpose or mission? You should know why you want to be there and you should know a little bit about them before you even apply. And when you do that, there's no way you're going to get caught off guard when when you have that initial conversation with them, that that initial interview, um, which is a situation that I've had. I've had students say, yeah, I was just totally caught off guard. I hadn't done my research. If you do your research before you apply, there's never a chance that you won't have something to go to bat with when that call comes. And that call will come. That call will come. So the other reason I like I like this approach is I'm asking you specifically to to go through and identify the types of jobs that you're going to want to get out of bed every morning and go do. All right. When you scatter shot, when you like to say, okay, UX design, and here's 10 jobs, and I'm just gonna send it to those 10. When you scatter shot like that, you have no idea really who you're applying to. You're just saying, oh, you've got a job, I need to trade my time for your money, let's go. And I don't want you to ever do that. And I, frankly, I don't think it's good for you. I don't think it's good for the employer. Not every job, not every job that you get even a an offer for is gonna be a fit. So this is very much like dating. You wouldn't just like, you wouldn't go on to something like Tinder and then just like, I, I don't know if it's swipe left or right, I'm, I'm not dating, but um, whatever the swipe is, you wouldn't just immediately say, oh yeah, the first 10 that I see, I'm, I'm, I'm going to like try to get a romantic connection with those 10. You'd be more selective. So I would hope that you'd be more selective here. All right, the job hunt is key. Pick your spot. What type of job is it? Why are you, why are you, why do you want that particular type of job? How are you connected? And then what are you missing? Because when you identify what you're missing, it make it, it allows you to be, come up with a strategy for how to address those things. And we're all missing something. These job postings are insane. And that's one reason if we come down, that's one reason why I've got the YouTube channel and I advise everybody to go take advantage decoding job descriptions right there career guidance for designers decoding job descriptions that's a video i think that you get a lot out of um, to help you push forward 
what what are they really asking for when you see these things? Because everybody's got a list of things they want that's like 18 miles long. What are they really looking for? The coding job descriptions, that's for you. But back to Rebecca. Rebecca is currently working through her portfolio. So like, so like, yeah, she's identified Skylight and I was, I was bragging about Skylight and if you're interested in Skylight, you'll see that in the newsletter that's coming out. If you're not, oh, wait, wait, you, did you say that you weren't part of the newsletter yet? Well, go over to new, newpragmatic.com and sign up for that. But Skylight is a amazing remote job opportunity that I think really everybody should apply for. Um, Rebecca, I know that 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 directly impacts you wanting to work at this would be my dream job. But I think that, you know, you have to understand it, a lot of people are going to apply, um, particularly if I'm like banging the drum on it. But before we apply, Rebecca, we have to have an awesome portfolio. And that means I'm going to come back over to Figma, where you are currently working through Okta. And Okta was, Okta has been this ongoing project that you've been working on. Um, we've kind of walked through the hierarchy of this hero unit. One of the things that I mentioned earlier um, as I was going through was that the hierarchy was flipped a bit. Uh, so in, in, for instance, uh, like this label here is 18, but yet your, um, but yet your, um, button is set here at 20. I think that, you know, this should be 20. I must've double clicked that. Sorry. Um, this should be 20 and that should be 18 or even more of a difference, um, 22 and 60. Whatever it is, it needs to be flipped. It shouldn't be inverted like it was previously. The other thing is, um, you've got a lot of copy here on user surveys. Um, you know, there's some, there's some, there's something going on here. I'm gonna delete that away. There is a fair amount of data in here that I would like to suss out and put into some sort of uh, uh, chart, um, probably like a pie chart or something. However, um, I'm I'm always iffy on do I really need do I really need my user surveys? Um, user surveys are really a tool to build a cohort with. I'm really more interested in your interviews. Um, but if you've got survey data, I think that's fine. Um, I would rather see this in some sort of chart form than in like a big paragraph. When we get down here, I'd mentioned I'd mentioned earlier again that it's because I'm doing a re-recording of this of this uh, episode of Feedback Loop. I mentioned earlier that like having this paragraph for uh, for Jin and Q is an issue because really I should be able to. I should be able to create a couple of simple rectangles uh, or copy a block, copy blocks for each of these. And then, then you come down to the similarities between them. And I think the similarities between them are fine. So I would break this top part up and allow this similarities piece to, to, to ride. I think that's fine. Um, user stories. I'm really only interested in the high value user stories. Like the uh, ones, these are the things that you're going to test. Um, you know, and when you get into mobile, the, the problem here is like, this is just going to, that, that's what it's going to be on a mobile device. And that's a real problem. You know, that, like you're not going to be able to, you're not gonna be able to make anything out of that on mobile. However, if you smartly broke this apart into items of high importance as a retailer, as a wholesaler, and you pulled out these tasks this is this could be responsive all right and and being able to make this into a responsive element means that it's going to display fine on mobile it's going to display fine on desktop and you've got more control over it it's it's the same mentality as taking your personas and making and, and pulling them out into into html components rather than sticking with the the PDF you made and then shrinking that down and blowing that up. 
same idea. Like this right now is a screenshot of your of your Google spreadsheet. You don't need that. Um, I would focus on the high importance and then I would break it out into some sort of logical construction that allows you to display it in a responsive manner. And the rest of this, it looks like you're it looks like you're still working on it. So, so really, I would focus on, you know, I, I, I do I do appreciate the adjustment that you've made to the competition. Um, you've kind of summarized, and you're linking to the SWOT analysis. I know you've got a lot more information there, but now I want to I want to like really drill down on okay, what are we really showing with surveys? I don't I do not want this much copy. Um, if, if there's a couple of charts that you want to put in here, that's fine. Um, personas let's break this first paragraph apart so that it, it's Jen and Q stories let's, let's edit let's edit this down to where we've got something that's responsive um, and really you know this is this as as I stated yesterday your case study is an exercise in editing edit 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 so so we're staying on that and then the the question the question that we got um, that I saw come over is, or I saw a statement from you about Webflow. It's like, do I do Webflow or do I, or do I just do this in HTML and CSS? Um, honestly, there's nothing, there's nothing hard about this design. You know, there's nothing like, oh my goodness, I, how, how do I pull this off um, in like CSS grid? Right now, You've got a basic structure that's staying on a grid. Um, you've you've got you've measured in from the sides. Like I see this as, I see this. You know, I'm just going to draw some basic shapes here. I see this as a hero unit. So you've got some sort of hero section, and then I see it as, you know, a grid. And the only reason I'm I'm staying grid and wide here is because you have a couple of areas you have a couple of areas like this where you've got some sort of section and i think that you could apply a section you know in and in through here while still having that grid dominate as you go down so so I really, I really don't see the need between you and me. I don't see the need to come back and say, "Oh yeah, I totally need to create this in Webflow." Um, you could, like, there's there's nothing hard about Webflow. It's just that you kind of need to know HTML and CSS to use it. And for those of you that say I'm wrong, uh, that's fine. Show me. Show me somebody who knows nothing about HTML and CSS that's done anything worthy in Webflow. Most of the people that I see creating things in Webflow are people that could code up their code up their their work in HTML and CSS, but they've decided not to for whatever reason. All right, Webflow is actually a pretty cool CMS tool. Um, if you wanted to like hand off a project to a client, uh, but I could also say you could just use WordPress and Gatsby together and like. WordPress is the CMS and Gatsby is the deployment. But really, I, I think there's a lot of different ways to skin that cat. When I'm looking at this, you know, this is pretty simple HTML and CSS. You could come over and do something like Webflow. So here's Webflow. And I'm just in a 404 page because I, I use the 404 page like a scratch pad. Um, if I came over and brought in like, hey, I'll bring in a section. And there's a section. And then uh, I said, okay, well, I'm gonna put a container in there. There's the container. And for the section, I'm just gonna quickly, I'm gonna put, quick, quickly put some colors in here so we can kind of see what's going on. So there's, there's a green, and then I'm gonna come into the container, and the container, I'm gonna say, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna be a blue, right? And I want that container to kind of size the um, section for me. Uh, typically, I would do this with content, but in, in, in light of not wanting to get in and bring a bunch of content in, I'm going to say a minimum height. Uh, oh, actually, I have to have that container selected. Um, so there's my container. And 
Wait. Finger width is locked. Oh yeah. Okay. So it's locked. I can't like make it wider. But uh, if I want to say three hundred or three hundred pixels for that. Okay. So now you, you kind of get the idea. Of, like, ooh, the container is controlling the height of the section. Yeah, that's kind of how it works. And then if I came, you know, so this is like the hero unit that you have. And then if you came back and said, yeah, I want to add another element, I'm going to add a container below. Well, you'll notice that that container is, it's, it's basically a class. And they've said that, oh, hey, this container class is like, I don't know, 800 wide. <coughs> Excuse me. So this container class is 800 wide. And I can come in and I can then say, oh, you know what? I'm going to bring in some columns into that container. And now that container has columns. And they're going a little wide. Um, so, you know, now I've got to kind of come in here and figure out, okay, well, why is it going wide? Um, I could also just say, you know what? I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to come in and, you know, I'll bring in a, I'll bring in a div. Okay, so here's my div. And in my div, I can, I can give it, I can give it, you know, I can say, okay, it's going to be grid or it's going to be, um, it's going to be columns and I could then give it a height and say, okay, it's going to be 300 pixels and then it's naturally bigger. And then I could go ahead and give it color and you get the idea. It's just, it's just like Legos that you, you pull in, you pull in and you, you make do your bidding. The, um, this is nothing that you can't do in HTML though, CSS. The real trouble for most people is, okay, I understand HTML and CSS, how do I get it online? And the way that you get it online, frankly, is you go through and you do my front end for designers YouTube course, you get command line, command line two, power of Git, Git and GitHub, prepping for front end work. Like you just go through that. And if you can, if you can make it through command line and get, you're online. Okay. There is no, I have to, you know, basically this is what, that's what Webflow is allowing you to do. Webflow is like a really overbaked Photoshop. It's Photoshop on steroids. And like, like when I look at these things, I just, I, I throw up in my mouth a little bit because it's like, oh God, it's Photoshop. I don't like Photoshop. Uh, Photoshop is way too complicated for what it needs to be. Um, I think Webflow is the same way. Uh, Webflow is fine, by the way. I'm not, I'm not against it. I, I, I think it's a fine tool. Um, I know, I know that, that their heart's in the right place, but I just want to edit and code. And if I can't get in here and like build the things that I want to build without figuring out how it works in Webflow, I just kind of go, Meh, and I just move back over to code. Um, it's really meant for people who are scared of code. Code's so stupid simple now um you know the 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 type of work that we do it's not you know nobody's asking you to get into a, like a python back end do anything there that, that's what we have that's why we collaborate with developers but doing fun and work that's that's really something we should be willing to do and we don't need webflow for that honestly and if i tried to get uh, a developer friend to work with me on a webflow project they would be confused um, so Webflow has its spot, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's this, like this is your portfolio. Let's just, let's just code it up. My suggestion to you would be go through front end for designers. Um, you know, it, it should take you like a day. All right. Take you a day to get online. Um, if you have questions, hop into the discord channel, we'll go back and forth. We'll work through it. But by and large, there's nothing about this that you can't do with some simple HTML and CSS. And I think once you start doing it, once you start moving forward, then you'll have a greater, you'll, you'll be more valuable, frankly, just as a designer. Um, you'll understand how, how front-end development works and you'll be able to move forward. So that's my two cents on that, Rebecca. Um, Cause I know you had a question, you looked at Webflow and you're like, I'm confused. And yeah, me too. You know, I look at it and I'm like, man, I gotta learn all these tools just to write some simple HTML, come on. Anyway. But that is all the time we have for this edition of the feedback loop. Um, it's a, you know, it's a little truncated today because I recorded it twice. Um, I look forward to seeing you all again here tomorrow. If you are at all interested in getting daily feedback on your work, 
hop into the new pragmatic discord channel and, and learn how this all goes down uh, you can sign up for it for early access at newpragmatic.com and uh, i hope to see all of you again here tomorrow 9 a.m central for the feedback loop take care